And we are live. Good morning. <clears throat> good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on in. Come on in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on in and let me know where you're coming from when you get here. Good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome to week 69. Come on in, come on in. Let me know where you are. We got Demetrius Scott in the building. Come on in, come on in. Principal Dot McKee Vegeta's in the building. We got a lot of folks. Let me quit this outlook so you don't hear another one of them chimes. Dawn Riddick, Allison Geary, Tawilla Burns, Janine Wilkins out there in Alaska, Lily Lanier, Sh Principal Siobhan Jackson, Sh uh, Shanta, Sh Sh Shante, oh man, where'd it go? Richardson is in the building. Principal Otis Kitchen's in the building. Principal Josh Tovar is in the building. Sharice Rodney D. Walker, Superintendent Finch is in the building. My man, Sean, where, where we at? 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 Oh, man, these names are going so quick. I was saying my man, Sean Woodley, is in the building. Michael Benton is in the building. Lavelle Johnson, Jennifer um, Mapes is in the building. Hey, folks, hit that share button as you come in. Hit it. Hit that share button. Hit that retweet button. Let them know we're in week 69. We got a big, we got a big session today. Let me get myself looking right, man. We got a big one today. Come on in, hit that share button. Some of you guys that lay back in the cut and, and, and you don't make comments. We got, I see Barianne Collins is in the building, Rhonda Wright. Some of you that don't make comments, let me let me see who you are. Cause see, I don't get to see you. I go a lot of places, folks say, oh, I watch you every week, but I don't recognize the names. They say, yeah, I don't make any comments. Those of you that don't make comments, <clears throat> I need to get some water. Let me see who you are. Right, so jump on in here. We got Shay Lewis in the building, Smith MN, maybe that means Minnesota, Kristen uh Rockwood's in the building, Stacy uh Wetzel, Mark Barnes, Kelly Thomas, they're all here. Ronte uh Ronte Barnes is in the building. Roz Gaskins just finished watching Roz, Dr. Roz a few minutes ago, and here she is in the building. Who else do we have here? We got Tabitha. Lakeese Lawson Seward in the building, Christopher uh, Faison, Charmaine Pierre, Crystal Nolan Brandon. Come on in, come on in, come on in. We're here, we're here. We got Dr. Sheikah Houston in the building, we got Merlina Valentine in the building, Vanessa Olive in the building, Suzanne Adams in the building. I think I said Josh Tovar, he's here. He'll be with us live next week. Mark your calendars right now. Principal Josh Tovar next Saturday this time. I'm not sure if I'll be here and in a hotel. I can't remember, but it'll but we'll be on. Right. Um, who we got? P um Puan. Oh man, Puana. No, I can't make that up. Puanani. That's it. Puanani Graham. I wasn't going to give up. Is in the building. Shanika. Mitchell's in the building, Tina Simpson's in the building, Katrina Washington, Rebecca Baron Fuentes, Ohio Girl, Joan, Stephanie Jacobs, they're all here. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer Melissa is in the building. Come on, y'all. Come on in. Hit the share button. Hit the retweet button. Let them know we're here. What time is it? Man, it's 11 o'clock. I got to get going. We got so much here. You know, we got Dr. Marcus Jackson in the building. So let me say to you formally, Man, I need to get some water for this one. I don't have any. I forgot to get my son usually drops a bottle of water here, but he stepped out for a minute. So I'm 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 flying solo. So I'm gonna have to preserve my voice. But let me say to you formally now, good morning. Mm -hmm. Greetings. Mm -hmm. Welcome to week 69 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. And look here, y'all, this is where I lose my voice every Saturday. I don't know about you. I don't know. But I think I know because you tuned in. But let me just speak for me real quick. I just want you to know. I, I just want you to feel this. I'm on fire. That's how I'm feeling, y'all. 
There go my son. He just walked in. Yo, give me a bottle of water, man. <laughs> I'm on fire, y'all. But but see, I don't know if you heard me. You know, now that I know the water's coming, now I can let it out, right? I just want you to know real quick that I'm on fire. Woo! Yes. That's how I'm feeling. Thank you. I need that when I do that. That's how I'm feeling, y'all. Why, though? Y'all been watching the news this week and you've been watching the world this week. You just, you know, just you don't even have to watch the news. Just open your eyes and see all the challenges of the world, including on the East Coast. A hurricane is headed right for right for Long Island. We're going to get the remnants here in Jersey, but we're not going to get the direct hit. It's, it's stuff going on, man. You, you know, Afghanistan, Delta, Haiti. You know, it's, it's just so much. But you chose leadership. And because you chose chose leadership, you must bring the flames. So let me say this to you. I got my quick message to you. You know, I've, I've been staying with this protecting theme for quite a while and I'm still on it. I'm calling this protecting your ideas. Once again, protecting your ideas. Let me give you this backdrop. Back in on October 16, 1995, that date should mean something to somebody out there. October 16, 1995, I get on a bus and I go to the Million Man March, the first one. I came back with this idea. Like, like an idea is this little itty bitty thing that can germinate into something spectacular. And I came back with this idea. I said, I want to create, I want to replicate the experience of the Million Man March. And over, over time, I kept growing it and kept growing it and kept growing it until it was right where I wanted it to be, right? But I don't know that everybody was on board with that. This little itty bitty thing called idea. I said, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make this thing happen. And I did. But it came from my experience of being at the Million Man March. I'm saying to you that your, your idea could be this little itty bitty thing. You can't let others discourage you because they don't have the foresight that you have. You can't do that. You can't let others because they're because they're small minded or their world is small. Right. They don't have the big ideas. They don't see the bigger picture. You can't let them get into your space, into your head. And you and you are discouraged from your own idea, which may be the game changer, the breakthrough that you've been looking for. You have to protect it. You have to guard it. You got to shield it. You got to embrace it. You can't let somebody come and sap you, undermine you, sabotage you of your idea. That little itty bitty thing, I-D-E-A. This little thought, this little notion that you have that can sprout into something big, something spectacular. Protect it. Let's go. Let me do these quick announcements. Number one, congrats to all the folks out there landing these positions, man. AP, principal, and even beyond. Congrats to all of you. I appreciate all the emails, the inboxes, the DMs. And, and, and in person, because a lot of y'all, I, I met you in person and you told me, I appreciate it. Keep it coming. If I can give you, I mean, just, just a little something on my head that benefits you, then hey, keep it going, right? So congrats to all the folks. If, you, if you're somebody out there and you just got your position or you're just starting, put it in the thread so we can clap you up. I'll get to it when I read them later on today. I'm taking another me day today. You know, yesterday, some of you guys know I took one. I'm taking another one today. Except for this, because but I love this. You know, this ain't work. This is just having a ball talking to y'all on Saturday mornings. Next, um, welcome to the first timers. You know, I've been I've been on the road heavy saying to folks, look here, y'all, y'all gotta, you know, if you enjoyed the presentation last week or whatever week it is, you can we can continue this every Saturday at 11, 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. So that for all the new folks out here, welcome aboard, strap in. Stay with us. I'm going to do this until I can't speak anymore, right? I, I said the goal was 100. I'm going to do this until I just can't do it, right? So I'll probably be doing this when I'm 100 years old. I'll be sitting here, um, on fire, right? But I'll still be here doing it, man. 
Let's keep going, y'all. Shout out to Principal Byron Morrison and AP Cynthia Rush of Pontiac School District in Pontiac, Michigan. I know they, I know, I know Cynthia, Assistant Principal Cynthia Rush, she probably thought I wasn't going to remember this. Shout out to Principal Byron Morrison, AP Cynthia Rush. I ain't even going to tell you why I'm shouting them out. They know, right? So shout out to both of y'all. You know I love the work you do. Keep on doing that strong work. Uh, y'all, make sure you get this, man. It's it's moving. Too, it's No, nah, I was going to say too fast. That would be undermining me. It's moving fast, y'all. It's just moving. Get yourself a copy. The Equity and Social Justice Education 50 Critical Questions for Improving Opportunities and Outcomes for Black Students. Get yourself a copy, but the book is blazing hot. I can't even keep it in one hand long because my hand gets hot. So, so make sure you get your copy if you don't have it. Man, ASCD can't keep enough of these things. They moving. So I thank all of you to have a copy, and I thank all of you who are going to get a copy. I'm almost done, y'all. Um, new wave of, of teachers and leaders, educators going back to school this week. Much success to all of you. Hit it out the park. Um, last one, and then I'm ready. Sean Hurt comes on at 10 o'clock every Saturday morning, followed by Create and Educate, Dr. Sheikha Houston and Tammy Taylor at 1030, myself at 11, and then Josh Tovar rounds us out on Sunday nights with um, Unlock the Middle at 7 o'clock on his page. So that's, you know, just want you to know it's not just me on here. It's, you know, we got, we got, folk, we got a network. We family. Myself, Sean, Sheikha, Tammy, Josh, we family. You know, so we promote each other. So make sure you're checking them out as well. Look here, y'all. We do this every Saturday morning because the whole intent is to hit home runs. That's that's why we do this, to hit home runs when you get back to school, to hit grand slams when you get back to school, to knock the ball out of the park. That's why we do this. So I use this symbolically. You might want to get you one. And put it in your office to, to remind you I'm about hitting home runs. That means children are achieving at the highest possible level. And then we self-reflect. But we stay locked in. Right? So with that said, man, I got a guest today, y'all. Oh, man, I got a guest today. I'm going to bring him up in a second. Let me read his bio. I got a guest today. I got a guest in the building, man. I got so many papers in front of me. Here we go. I got a guest in the building. Y'all know the guest. Y'all know him. He's no stranger. This is Dr. Marcus Jackson. No stranger. Let's let's let, let me read this bio, y'all. Got to read this. You you might want to you might want to call a friend like like not, don't don't even send a, a tag or a share. I mean, do that, but but you might want to call somebody like, yo. Dr. Marcus Jackson is on with Principal Cafele. You, you you put the put the lawnmower down, right? Turn the TV off, right? You know, whatever you do on Saturday, like forget that for now. Dr. Marcus Jackson's in the building, right? Let me read his bio. Dr. Marcus Jackson is an internationally recognized educator, professional author, and expert in curriculum instruction and school administration. Just that alone. <laughs> Yo, call somebody. His 20-year career is distinguished by increased student achievement and school improvement. He's just completed a three-year tenure as Zone Director of Curriculum and Instruction for Calcasieu Parish School Board, where he successfully transformed 14, let me say that again, successfully transformed 14 low-performing schools contributing to the school system moving from a C to a B status on their state report card that's why you need to call somebody like yo we principal kafele got dr jackson on he transformed 14 schools went from a c to a b in a short period of time yo homie go to principal kafele's page and jump on here he he has written several articles for various publications on leadership and school improvement He's been the recipient of over of, of several awards. I guess I could say over so, uh, over well several awards, including the Teacher of the Year, Early Leaders in Education Award, Principal of the Year, Community Servant Award, and recently the recipient of the 2021 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major for Justice Excellence in Education Award. Hmm. He's the author of several books: Ten Daily Essentials for Principals. 
the new one, 10 Daily Essentials for Assistant Principals, which he'll talk about, Social Emotional Support for Educational Leaders, Social Emotional Support for Teachers, and two children's books, Because My Teacher Said I Can, and School and Life, I'm sorry, and School and Life Living in the Middle. He believes in the power of collaboration, continuous learning, hard work, celebrating progress, supporting principals and teachers to ensure that each child receives a world-class education. He currently serves as the, hear this now, Chief Academic Officer. It's a new position. Chief Academic Officer for Lancaster Independent School District, Lancaster ISD, in Lancaster, Texas. So he just got that position. I think we applauded him last week for it on the thread, but you feel free to do so again. So I'm going to bring to the screen our brother, Dr. Marcus Jackson. Dr. J, say hello to the good people out there. Good morning. Good morning, Brother Cafele, Principal Cafele, and good morning, everyone. I am filled with energy, excitement, and enthusiasm um, about this morning. I am ready to provide some information, and hopefully with that information, I'm able to provide some inspiration. And with that information and information, I hope that people can go out and make an impact um, to principals, uh, to assistant principals, to their teachers, and most importantly, to their students. I'm excited about this morning, man. I am too, man. It's good. I'm glad to see you here. Glad you're here. You know, um, folks, our topic is teacher development is at the core of your leadership, right? Teacher development is the core is at the core of your leadership. So here we got this leadership audience. And I'm saying, you know, this is me talking. It's not even Dr. Jackson. This is me saying teacher development is right there at the core, at the center. And, 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 and I'm thinking about yesterday. And yesterday, for those of you that may have seen a post I wrote, I said, I'm not doing anything today. I, I purposely left April, August 20th and August 27th blank on my schedule. I said, I'm not letting anybody book me for those two days. Those are mine. Right. So I hadn't had a day off since April 20th. And even before that, it was every day. Right. So so just just running my mouth, talking to folks, training, flying on planes, all that stuff. And I took a me day and, and it was a great day. I loved it. I just sat on the couch all day and watched television. Right. Didn't didn't answer emails. Just just chill. So here's my point. I want to ask Dr. Jackson. Dr. Jackson. Why? is a me day? Why is a do nothing day? Why is a rest day important to the leaders out there? It is so it is so important um, to unplug, unplug our principal Cafele for your mental um, wellness. And that is very, very tough to do. You and I talked before we actually came on and I commended you and I congratulated you for doing that. Just simply unplug. And I mean, that's everything. Put your phone down. Put your no emails. I'm not checking any text messages. And that allows you to rejuvenate um, your spirit, your soul and your mentality so you can reach and perform at your optimal level. Um, that is very hard to do as an educator. You and I have talked about track and field that we'll be watching today. And we're going to watch that through an educational lens. Yeah. We're going to watch that through a leadership lens. I can't even go to the supermarket without looking at uh, opportunity and thinking about teaching and learning. But there comes a time where you have to unplug it all um, in order for you to be your best. I love it. And you you, you guys heard that, you know, when, when Dr. Jackson said looking at things through the educate, educator lens or the educational lens, that's something that I'm guilty of as well. It's like, I can't watch anything. I, I watched this, this documentary yesterday, Malice at the Palace. You guys, the sports people would, well, everybody would know that, but the sports particularly when the, um, when you had that, that fight at the, the, um, at the palace in Auburn Hills, Michigan, when the Detroit Pistons were playing in this, and the players went in the stands and all that kind of stuff, but watching it, I'm looking at it as an educator. I'm not just looking at it as a sports fan to attain information. So a lot of times it's hard to turn that off. Like I said, I really wanted to turn everything off. But there's certain there's certain things in our psyche that's just there as a leader. And I'll just ask you guys rhetorically, is that you? Like, is leadership really ingrained in, in who you are, right? So, 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 Dr. Jackson, with that, you know, school is opening up now. And... You know, just in speaking to audiences, and I know you've spoken to some, and 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 there's there's anxiety, 
you know, around this around this pandemic, around this virus, around co coronavirus, COVID-19, Delta and any other variants that are out there. And 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 with that anxiety, I'm, I'm asking you your, just your thoughts, your opinion. Um, what what can a leader say or do to, to build confidence in teachers about just being medically safe within their schools and within their classrooms? What, what can what can the leader do to make them feel better? Well, as the leader, um, before you even delve into your school improvement plan, you must have a social emotional support plan. And that's not only for your um, students, but that's for your teachers, your staff, and even yourself. Uh, now, we're mentioning the pandemic, and we've been going through this since March 13, 2020. Um, I'm coming from Lake Charles, Louisiana, where not only did we go through the pandemic and currently still in the pandemic, but we went through a devastating hurricane that literally wiped the entire city out. The few people who came back were living in their garages and tents. Now, they came back from that, and about four, four or five weeks later, the city was flooded with Hurricane Delta. So we didn't start school until almost November. So we missed the first nine weeks of school. In the midst of that, Principal Cofele, uh, several weeks after that, the beginning of February, we had an ice storm. So those individuals who finally moved back into their homes, all the pipes burst into the homes and their homes are flooded again. And guess what? A few weeks after that, a few weeks after that, several weeks after that, rather, we had another historical flood where six feet of water took over the entire city. It was crazy. But three years ago, when I took that position to turn around um, those schools, the first thing I focused on was the mental health of the principals, the teachers, and the staff. And the other day, I just received a text message stating that some of some of the schools that I've actually served had the highest percentage of students performing at the mastery level on the state assessment last year in the midst of all of that. So my message to my educational leaders, begin with the effective domain first. Begin with the effective domain first. You have to take care of your staff, your students, and yourself mentally or you wouldn't even survive until the end of september i promise you you won't that's powerful stuff and you you guys you you all out there heard him he said the affective domain first you know sometimes you know we're feeling all that pressure to raise test scores and we going in there and we want to be academic from day one and that's i mean it just can't be that way because students have their own realities they have their own world they're dealing with with their own challenges and obstacles and what is it about coming into that school in this case the question was related to staff what is it about coming into that school that i can i can kind of feel at ease right in in terms of just the challenges of mask and no mask and vaccines and no vaccines and six feet apart and three feet apart and not six feet and three you know all those challenges that come along with it what can you do? And I, I, I love what you said about the, the affective domain. So, so, so consistent with that question, you know, the reality of the pandemic has also taken an emotional toll on, on just a plethora of teachers nationally. I get to meet these teachers literally every day. And, and principals, when they call me, it's interesting how all the principals that call me, the superintendents, they're saying the same thing. They're saying, I, I just need you to fire my staff up. It's, it's very different now. I need you to fire them up. I need you. I just need you to bring something that's motivational, something that gets them feeling good about themselves, about being back, about the about the prospects of the future. You know, all of that. So I'm asking you, Dr. Jackson, I'm saying, well, well what can a leader do to restore the enthusiasm that, that the teacher had? But but with today's times, it may be waning. What can that leader that's watching right now that probably has the same question? What can they do? What can they say to restore that enthusiasm? Well, um, one of the things that was actually uh, very powerful for me as a principal um, and even as a district level leader, as I mentioned, I focus on that effective domain piece. And um, I always um, felt that it was important to connect before I tried to correct anything. I have to connect first. So first of all, uh, during our pre-planning pre meetings, with my um, teachers one-on-one -on -one after they've, I bought a speaker in such as the principal Cafele or Dr. Earl Suttles or Dr. Anthony Muhammad, I bought someone in to set my teachers on fire. How would I keep that fire burning? 
And my start is usually during our pre-planning meetings. That's why I'm able to connect with each staff member one-on-one. -on -one. And there are a few questions that I, that I asked during that particular time, uh, Principal Cafele. Uh, I asked them, how do you feel about this um, upcoming school year? How do you feel? See, now I'm collecting quantitative data and I'm getting a pulse of what's going on in my school. Afraid, concerned, I ask them to give you one word and write those words down. And then you'll be able to form your little word wall with those particular words. I ask them, um, what are you most concerned about? And you'll be surprised that health, their mental health is right there at the top. And you have to address that. Thirdly, is there anything that's going on personally in your life? Me personally, first of all, before I ask that particular question, that third question, I revealed to them what's going on in my life. I revealed to them that I've lost 18 people last year. Um, I had to go to 13 funerals be before um, because of COVID. So I let them know that I too am dealing with, gr gr with grief, with pain. Um, and then I talked about, then I go into the cognitive. Um, what are the instructional um, weaknesses and strengths? See, I set all of that up. I set all, I was vulnerable. So I set all of that atmosphere up. And now I went into what are your instructional strengths and weaknesses? Now they're open to be honest with me and see now after these meetings with everyone individually, I can tear my teachers based off their wants and needs instructionally because they just provided me with that. I don't even have to look at the numbers. They told me them themselves and until they can personalize it, they can't rectify it. And I got that statement from you, um, Principal Cafele. So I'm going to give you uh, your props on that one. And finally, the most important, important questions of them all is, how can I effectively serve you as a leader? How can I effectively serve you as a leader? And they're going to be totally honest with you because you set that up. And now, once I made that connection with them individually, I have the same type meeting with um, grade levels. Because what you will find is a different need from grade level to grade level. And by the end of um, probably the first two days of us coming back together, I have a whole pulse of our school, a plethora of notes. And now I meet with my leadership team. And now we have a mental health wellness plan for our uh, stu student, students, teachers and staff. And now we can move into the school improvement plan because everybody's not only fired up because you came fire, fire us up, but now they're concerned about the school and they're excited about the rest of the school year. You said a lot there. And um, one of the things, let's let's stay here. You said, how can I serve you effectively, right? And sometimes, you know, it's, it's easy to lose sight of, 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 of us of, of us being these servants, these servant leaders. So servant leadership, how can I serve you effectively? I, I would dare challenge everybody out here to write that one down and ask yourselves every day, how am I serving you? my staff effective daily right that's powerful let's 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 keep it moving um you know i'm 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 known i've said this all the time it's one of my staple questions for a teacher to ask oneself um are my students at an advantage because i am their teacher once again are my students at an advantage because and the emphasis being on the word because because i am their teacher and my question to you dr jackson is what can a leader say or do to help a teacher to embrace a question like that where i'm where i'm asking you the teacher to look into your mirror and to come to grips as to whether or not you matter like 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 your students are at an advantage because you happen to be in their space that's that's a difficult one of those 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 questions it's a difficult question but it's also an uncomfortable question it, it can create discomfort but that's not a bad thing but what could you say to a leader to help them to em embrace that question and own take it own it as their as their own well um first of all i think um you have to understand and we have we, we have a preconceived notions that um teachers know and in actuality um they don't um so most importantly what teachers need from you to actually create 
that um, confidence level that um, my students are an advantage um, because I'm their teacher is you need to support that teacher. And most effect, most, most importantly, you must help that teacher become thirsty for knowledge. Mm. Um, you must create a culture of how. Um, I just wrote a blog on that. It was on my mind heavy last night, creating a culture of how. Principal Philly, this week, I actually, um, I'm new on the job. Um, we're just starting this new um, remote learning piece where students were going face to face. So we started a new component of um, remote learning. Um, before the presentation, the facilitator came to me and she had all these questions and these concerns and I gave her a couple of tips. So I wanted to go in and actually support this particular facilitator. And she went in, Principal Cofele, with all these teachers and she was providing them with information. And Principal Cofele, this particular presenter um, was asked a question, actually three questions. And she said, you know what? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I promise to get it for you. And on that third question, it was something about breakout quest, breakout rooms and things of that nature. And the final question, she said, um, whoa, I don't know neither. And, and I said, I don't know how to do that neither. Now, this is the chief academic officer raising his hand. I'm, I'm chief now. I'm raising my hand. So we got into another portion of the lesson, and I didn't understand how to do something. And I was like, excuse me. They were taking a virtual tour on Microsoft something, and they would take a virtual tour all around the world. And they had a little airplane where you can take an area view. Mm -hmm. And I was just so amazed. And I was like, wow, could you do that again? Could you show me? I don't know how to do that. Well, she went through the what, the when, the why of the lesson. And then she left the teachers with the how. And I raised my hand and I said, I don't know how to do that. So all the teachers turned around to me, Principal Cafele, and they say, I don't know how to do that either. Mm. I don't know how to do that either. And she said, boom, let's stop right here. And she showed us. And right there at that moment, I knew I had him. Yeah. And see, what I did was I created a culture of how yeah. do you do that? Yeah. How do you? So now everybody was thirsty. Oh, Principal Cafele, I had him, baby. I yeah. had him at that particular time. We broke off into sessions. And I was just going from classroom to classroom to classroom. And I heard, heard the word how 47 times wow. in a two hour period. Wow. And at the end of that session, end of that session, man, those teachers were filled with energy, excitement, and enthusiasm. And remember those three eyes I talked about. You got to provide that information. You got to give them that information. And with that information, you provide inspiration. And with that inspiration, they're able to go on and have an impact and you have to show them how to do what you're asking them to do. Because many times teachers don't know accelerated learner. What do you mean? I got to teach the standards and I have to fill in those gaps in real time. I don't know how to do that, yeah. but we just lay it on them. And then what, but once they know how to do it and we show them how, and you create that culture of how they're going to come back to you and they bring it back to their students. And now that environment is set up as that, okay, you in my class, you're in Principal's Cafele class, you're about to shine and soar, baby. I, I, you know, I, I love everything you said. I don't even want to leave this point, man, because here you are new to the district. And quite frankly, you're, you're positioning yourself in, in this new space. And here you, you were able to gauge that not only did you not understand something, but you knew that there were a plethora of other people in there that didn't as well. But you had the audacity to speak up on it, right? So now it's like, folks, yeah, I, I can relate to him because he's real. He's authentic. See, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to somebody out here in this in this audience this morning. I can I can identify with him, right? But he but he saw where I'm not understanding, but I may not feel comfortable with sharing with others that I don't understand, but I got this person that had my back and he talked about, he didn't understand. So, so see, on, so, so on the one hand, I heard that, but I want to tell you something else. I heard there are folks in this audience. I, I know this definitively who want to become professional speakers, right? They want to, they want to, they want to speak from time to time, if not do it full time. And what you did, Dr. Jackson, 
you you turn that experience from yesterday into a story i was hooked like i'm like where where is he going with this and i bet you everybody out there was asking the same question where is he going with this that's at the core of being a public speaker when you have stories to tell that your audience can identify with and you hook them with that story right so so i just wanted to you know and i don't even think that was your intent but i just want to make i want to highlight that to somebody out there that's like i want to speak but i don't know this and that this and that you got to be a storyteller you got to be able to take real life experiences and turn those into stories let me go back to dr jackson because man i got some stuff here okay hey, doc, I don't, this is not even a question this is a statement i got for you uh -huh. Talk to talk to the teachers. Talk talk the teachers out here. Even though we're leadership focused, there are teachers out here. Talk to the teachers very quickly about the power of the why purpose. Mm -hmm. But the teachers, I'm gonna get to the leaders. The teachers. It's so important to um, understand um, why um, you got into this profession. Let me give you my why first, uh, and then. You can actually think about your why subconsciously and actually it's always important to go back to that why. Uh, I didn't um, choose education as a profession. Um, education chose me. I was a community coordinator with the city of Atlanta where I designed and coordinated programs for youth at promise. I don't use the term youth at risk. Um, so after school, I'm right down in the city of Atlanta, Grady Homes, um, serving that community where about 300 kids uh, ages six through 18 came to the community development center after school, football, baseball, basketball, after school tutorial program, computer training. We actually did it all. Now this is in some, one of the most poverty stricken areas. And I had, a, I was coaching little league football at the time. And my, um, quarterback on my foot football team bought home all F's and his mom wanted to take him off the team. Now that was troubling to me because this particular student was eight years old, but he was my mentor for my kindergarten students. He ran the kindergarten class for me, helping them with their homework. So I went to this particular teacher's classroom and I asked mom, could I meet with, have a conference with the teacher? The teacher said, yes. So I went to that particular teacher's classroom and I was blown away at what she said to me. She said, Coach Jackson, this is what they called me at the time. And it was 24 kids in that particular classroom. And she said, Coach Jackson, we're second graders. She said, Those, these kids are not going to amount to anything in life. Now, she used the profanity word that start with the word, uh, the letters S-H in life. She said, the boys are going to be in prison or dead um, by the um, age of 18, and the girls are going to be pregnant on welfare. Totally, totally blew my mind. And so I said to myself, I enrolled in Georgia State University at that particular time, and I said, I want a classroom where a group of students will be an advantage because I was their teacher and they will feel love, they will feel honored, and they will feel uh, obligated to reach their optimal level. That was my why. And just so, how, just so happened, God has increased my territory in regards to serving uh, multiple thousands of um principals, assistant principals, and teachers who are going to have an impact on the child. So it's always important to refer back to your why. It's always important to refer back to your why because it will keep you grounded, especially in crazy times like this. Uh, the political uh, turmoil that we're in. I mean, a mask. So we're, we're having, we're fighting and we're marching over a mask and you got all these extraneous variables to take you off track to take you off focus, but your why will always keep you grounded and you should refer to it daily. Get you one of these sticky notes, grab your sticky note and actually put that why on that mirror uh, where you comb your hair, where you brush your teeth at, and that reminds you why you're going into the school uh, and what's your purpose. I love it. You know, what about, what about when I'm a leader? You know, I'm assistant principal, I'm principal, and, and, and the why may be a little bit different than what it was when I was a teacher. It may and it may not. For me, it was kind of the same, but, but, but I do respect the, the difference between the two relative to just being a leader of, of a school. 
What would you say about the power of the why for a school leader, whether it be assistant principal or principal? That actually shift um, quickly for me when, when I became an um, assistant principal. Um, but the foundation remained the same. I just had more kids. Mm -hmm. I talked to you about the 24 kids that was in this particular teacher's class and the uh, 100 kids that I was responsible for because we departmentalized when I was a teacher. And matter of fact, the 1,200 students um, that I was responsible for because I was always a physical education teacher. So I was an advantage because all the kids wanted to come to me because it was a fun time. They got away from the schoolwork. But through my physical education piece, I was able to in infuse the curriculum in that as well. But when I became an assistant principal, now I'm responsible for everybody, not only the students, but I'm responsible for the teacher as well. So my why shift, but my foundation of my why remained the same. And that was serving the students. But now I had to feed the teachers so they wouldn't eat the kids. Yeah. So that's a whole different ball game in regards to dealing with the adults. So I had to study, I had to do some research. Uh, Principal Cafele provides you with a variety of books on um, dealing with difficult people, uh, connecting with individuals. Uh, I forget the titles, but he, he throws out to you daily uh, on how to build successful relationship with adults. And he's not just throwing these books up just because He's throwing these books up because they're vital to you because it's a whole different ball game with dealing with adults. So that foundation piece was the kids. Second, that second layer was actually serving and assisting my principal to ensure that her vision came to fruition. And I was that bridge as an assistant principal between her because people wouldn't go directly to the principal. They would come to me with all the issues that was actually going on with the school. And guess what? Many of them were asking me, this is just between us. Uh, please don't mention that to Dr. Walker. And I'll be like, okay, I had to remain, keep that trust there, but I could not keep that from my principal. So my principal and I had a way of actually addressing those issues without her letting, um, without her um, letting everyone know that um, I received the information from them. So serving those teachers and providing them with everything that they need and some of what they want so they can better serve the students, which will eventually make the school look good, which will eventually make the community look good and the school district look good. I love it. That why. Now, here, here, here's the hard part. How does a leader, because we got mostly leaders out here, how does the leader matter of fact let me let me let me let me back this up let me let me let me give it a foundation i know just through my work that there are educators out here in this case i'll focus on the teacher that does not necessarily think about a why or does not necessarily consider the why or does not necessarily know their why they just love teaching they love children they go to work but it's not being driven by a, a definite purpose they're just there. They love what they do. My, my question to you is, how would a leader help that teacher to develop a deeper sense of purpose for doing this work? I actually uh, mentioned a few examples um, in regards to connecting during the um, pre-planning piece. But communication is essential, um, Principal Cafele, and that must happen. Um, every day, um, every single day, I visited every single classroom. And brother, I've been following you, following you for some time. Um, you made sure every single day, every teacher saw you and you visited every single classroom. Let me let me repeat myself again. And I got this from you, brother. Yes, sir. I visited every single classroom every day. And you did the same thing, Principal Fella. And guess what? You did not have your laptop. Mm -mm. You did not have a notepad. And you didn't take notes. You came there to be visible. And you came there for the experience. Now, you being the exemplar leader that you are, it didn't take you long if you saw something wrong. Right. And then you pulled that teacher to the side and you addressed that immediately. And by the time you got to the, and you did that daily, 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 daily. And by the time you got to the observation piece, 
those little problems or issues were taken care of because you saw that all the time. Always saw. So in regards to helping that teacher understand the, their why, you must create that relationship with that particular teacher. Remove all the paperwork, remove the computers, take all that stuff away and form an instructional relationship with that particular teacher outside of everything else. And then from there on, as you continue to go by and visit her classroom, you're going to see that teacher grow. You're going to be able to point out things like I did with that facilitator because Principal Cofele, she had no idea of what she did by telling everybody being vulnerable. I don't know how to do that. She had no idea. So guess what? As soon as we took a break, it was two of them. I pulled them to the side. I was like, you have great leadership potential inside of you. You did something phenomenal today. And she was like, what? And I was like, you was vulnerable. And she was like, mm. what, did, what did that have to do with anything? And I explained that to her. Yeah. And that meant the world to her. And see, now she's understanding her. She's new to this district too and new to leading adults. So now she's understanding a piece of her why, and that's okay. It's okay for me to teach adults, but it's okay for me to um, be vulnerable and create a culture of how. And you have to reveal that you don't know everything. And once you do that, then slowly that teacher will um, be able to understand their why, as well as that particular assistant principal who may not have understand understood their why as well, and you all are learning why you're doing this work together. I love it. <clears throat> I love it. That that why, you know, again, one one could walk into a building and just love the work, love, love teaching and learning. But but it, but but this is this it's, it's something when we bring those hands together and we've got that thing that said this is what what keeps me going. This is this this is what keeps me tossing and turning. This is what dominates my thinking, my thoughts. This is that thing I said I will not rest until this is accomplished. That why. And you, you got to have that why. And, 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 and I know you've been walking in yours all this time. You know, I'm looking, you know, as I look at the names on the thread and I, and I see a Carlos Baggage who's, who's, who's been a principal for about two weeks now. Right. And a Byrian Collins. I think she's been an AP for about a um, for I think a year now. If I'm not mistaken. And having the opportunity to listen to you this morning. That speaks to my why in terms of who I am as a presenter, right? To to not just hear my voice, but to hear powerful other voices. There are people on this thread that don't even know I'm going to be calling them to come on here at some point, but they'll get the phone call. But just having this platform where one could be in their home, in their car, on the treadmill, whatever it is, and get the same PD that a district may be paying thousands of dollars for, right? That's a why as well. So that, that why is crucial to your work. So so with that, you know, I frequently I ask teachers, Doc, I say, do you teach math or do you teach Matthew? And you know, with math being the content area, but Matthew being a child. And I always say, you know, don't get those two twisted. It's 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 always got to be Matthew before math. And we'll teach math to Matthew. So I want to ask you, how can a leader shift a teacher's thinking who prioritizes content over children? Well, uh, Principal Fillet, here's another activity that I've actually done. And um, you followed me for some time. Yeah. Um, even as a principal, uh, I had a classroom. I had an actual literacy center. Um, where I went around three times a day and I pulled kids and I had three 45 minute sessions. Um, nobody could pull me during that particular time. Mm -hmm. And my students knew my schedule. My teachers knew my schedule. And guess what? They knew if they disturbed me during that particular time, it was a problem. Um, when I became um, the doc, uh, district director of curriculum instruction, I visited all those 14 schools every week. And I was still in the classroom. I was still with teachers planning. And even in my position, I'm actually doing the same. And speaking of that, um, Principal Cafele, 
Um, and it's so important for the leaders to stay connected um, to the particular, um, to the classroom um, at all times. And you asked the second part of your question. What was that second part of your question? So how, 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 do, how do we help leaders to work with teachers towards shifting the thinking from teacher of content first, as opposed to teacher of children first? Yes, quick activity real quick. It's imperative. Uh, remember when I told the teachers it's, it's important to start with the effective domain first? What I've always done with my principals, with my teachers, and most importantly with my students, I asked them what was, I helped them try to define their purpose. And for example, we quickly ask kids, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Which is a, um, which is a horrible question to ask a child um, at seven years old, eight years old, when Principal Cofele Ed didn't hit you until your um, third, fourth year in college. Yeah. Um, you talked about your marijuana days and how you, and, and until you read that um, miseducation of the, uh, a Negro and that clicked into you and that spark. But we still didn't have it together, even our second and third year in college. So why would you ask a kid that? So an important piece is to connect the content with the child's interests and and purpose. And now you're able to um, assist the child with finding that purpose. Let me give you a quick example. Um, in all the districts and all the schools that I've actually covered, and even when I was a teacher, and it spread like wildfire because it was great. I have an activity, find your purpose. So I asked the kids, what do you like to do? And for the most part, I've always worked in African-American communities. We told the outlets were football, basketball, baseball or something else. The girls like designer, um, like to design things and things of that nature. So what I would do, I would take that principal cafele and I would tie that into the content. I got football. I got these, I got 18 boys in this particular classroom um, and six girls. So now I'm, I'm tying the angles of the wide receiver routes to math. For social studies, I'm looking at our conference. Is the Southeast Conference better than the Pac-10? What states are in the Southeast Conference? So now I hook these kids on social studies. Do science have anything to do with football? Absolutely. It's your resting heart rate. What system are you using doing football most, mostly? Your muscular system, your respiratory system. All of these things. Now, this is before I even taught a lesson. And see, now I'm connecting the child to something that they're interested in and once you do that first, then and only then can the child reach their optimal level. So I challenge my education, uh, my educators um, who are listening out there, my assistant principals and our leader. And if you need this little activity, just shoot me something on Twitter and I'll be glad to share that information with you. So go to Dr. Mark at Dr. Marcus Jackson, where I put the doctor in at Dr. Marcus Jackson and you'll be able to get in contact with him. So, so with that, you know, staying in the classroom, and this, you know, this is one of them broad questions. I probably should word it differently. But um, what are just some of your bullet points, key aspects of being an effective instructional leader? And, and when you answer that, keep the assistant principal in mind, that assistant principal that, that doesn't have that opportunity, so that person thinks, to be that instructional leader because of all the other aspects of being an assistant principal. What are, what are key components of being that person? Um, a couple key components of being a uh, instructional and effective and efficient instructional leader is um, first of all, it is imperative that you're able to connect before you can even go into all. I, I've always I'm, I'm going to stress that over and over again. You must begin with that effective domain piece first. Mm -hmm. And when you meet with the, these individuals, you must always start there. Secondly, secondly, you must be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about what is quality instruction. What is quality instruction? And that starts with quality learning. For me, when I go into a classroom, instead of looking at the objectives on the board or actually paying attention to the teacher, I go to the students. I go straight to the students because they will actually tell you and inform you everything you need to know about that teacher and the delivery of the level of delivery of instruction that she's actually providing. So you have to be able to have that strong connection between what the teacher is actually delivering 
and what the students are receiving. And what the students are receiving is most important because you can teach the blue out of the sea. You can hit all the points and it can look like a great lesson, but if the students didn't learn it, you were simply given a speech. So always go to the students first to find out the level of instruction that's going on in the classroom and the students will provide you with it. If they can't read correctly, if they can't write it correctly, if you ask them, 98% of our students will be able to convey to you. Now, it may not be as articulate as you might want it to be, but they will let you know if they're actually learning or not. And I can simply go into a classroom and I can look around and Principal Cofele, you was good at this. I watch it, brother. He used to, he used to have his hands in his pocket like this when he go into the classroom. And he used to just buff around and and the students will look up and they'll give him a head nod and then they'll go back to work because he created that culture and then he'll just go around and he'll just look at engagement first. Do the teacher have their attention? Do you have that first? Secondly, are they interested in the content and are they receiving the knowledge? And now you have different hands popping up, volunteering for the answer as a teacher as opposed to a teacher calling on a few students so they can try to impress me while I'm in that particular classroom. So start with the effective domain. Uh, pay very close attention, not only to the delivery of instruction, but most importantly, the receiving of the knowledge that's inside of that um, instruction. And um, pay very, very close attention to that learning piece. I love it. I love it. So let's, let's, let's stay with this then. I'm thinking about that leader who says, I, I just don't have enough time in the day. Um, you know, the, the culture of the building, as the, as the leader might say, the discipline in the building, the behavior of children, that I, I just, I cannot get into a classroom to do the things that you just delineated. What can I do so that I could be, because, you know, that person may be on the call now. I'm listening to you, Dr. Jackson, but I, I can't, I can't put my hands in my pocket and walk into a classroom. Cause I don't have, I don't feel like I have time. And the operative word is feel like seemingly I don't have time. How do I make that happen? For you, the principal, make it happen. Or the AP. Oh, you're, you're, you're the AP. Go to your principal. And if you're, and if you feel as if not, that's not being allowed um, for you to happen. Um, it is important that you actually sit down and you have to schedule the times. I'm sorry. You have to schedule those times and, Everybody in the building knew during these particular times. Don't bother Dr. Jackson. He's in classroom during these particular times. Don't bother Mr. Sessoms. He's in classroom. And, and Ms. Principal Cafele, there can be an altercation going by on in the hallway. And kids and teachers will see me passing by and they knew it was my observation time. They wouldn't even say nothing to me. Mm. They will handle the situation on their own because I'm going into my classroom time. But guess what? The teachers say it's Dr. Jackson's observation time and the students will get it together because they know I was coming for them afterward because they possibly disturbing my observation time. And as the principal and as the assistant principal, you set that tone. And there were only four B's, Principal Cafele, that can keep me from my, in those classrooms. If the boss called. That's the superintendent. The superintendent come get me. If the boys in blue are at the school, come get me. If something is wrong with my baby, my daughter, or my son, and they call the school, that's important. Stop it and come get me. And that final B, I was married at the time. So if my boo call, if my boo call, <laughs> come get me. And those were the only four things, Principal Cafele, that can keep me out of the classroom. But as the principal, as the assistant principal, you have to make time. And as an assistant principal, if you don't have this system set up, and I talk, I give you a schedule, what to do, when to do, how to do it in both books, 10 Daily Essentials for Principals and the 10 Daily Essentials for Assistant Principals, I talk about this, you have to schedule that time out. And you have to stick with it, unless it's one of those four Bs. I love the four B's, man. That's 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 powerful stuff. You know, for the folks who um who just want trying to gauge how much time I'm gonna take today, I got three more questions. So we good on time. It's eleven fifty-five. We we good. So so stay with us. Don't leave us. Stay with us. 
Hey, Dr. Jackson, um, and, and, and when I crafted these questions, I'm, I'm just thinking about the folks who are in the audience. I'm thinking about young leaders and all that kind of thing and, and, and things I've read in the comments, because I read all these comments every week. And sometimes they're over a thousand comments, but I read them all. And when you when you factor in the other platforms, because we're on four different platforms, there's a lot to read. But I, I, it, it allows me to gauge what's on the mind of a lot of people. So so with this question, talk to us about how leadership can go about building morale in a building amongst staff where there is toxicity in a building and folks that don't want to be there, they're disgruntled with being there, all that kind of thing. And what, what can I do to create a family and create a happy place, a happy space within the building? Well, um, you have to do something that many times and most leaders haven't mastered and that's become expert listeners. And in order to listen, look at the words in the um, in the word listen. You have to be silent. You have to be silent. And it's so important you and you can write this one down and you heard me talk about this often. You have to drop your ego soup and take a bite of humble pie because you don't know it all. And just as I did in that meeting as a new chief academic officer, I didn't know how to take no world tour on this Google thing that they were working on, man, but I was blown. Away. I know now I was playing with it last night about midnight, man. I can take you all around the world mm -hmm. and you have to be vulnerable, but most important, you have to listen. You have to listen. And it didn't take me long to realize that I didn't know everything. And then as I looked around when I, when I was an assistant principal, uh, man, I saw certain powerful teachers. And I start going to those teachers. What do you do in this or not? This teacher um, is giving me some resistance or some feedback about this. And I want her to, Dr. Jackson, I got it. Let me talk to her. And I saw that you had so much power inside of these buildings. And Principal Cafele, that's when I designed my organizational framework. Every school has four big rocks. You got the curriculum. You got the operation and logistics of the building. You got the achievement of the building, data analysis, those, those folks who like crunching numbers and all that stuff, and you got the culture and climate. Everybody in your school fits in one of those four. Mm. Everybody. Even that little nice lady who's going to bring you a little cupcake, it might just be one cupcake for your birthday, or she may bring you a pack of lifesavers and say, you saved my life yesterday. I came up to you and you were smiling. That person is on your culture and climate team. So when I was principal, everybody in the building was on the team. Everybody. You had to be on one of those teams. And guess what? That empowered everybody because they had a say-so in every decision that was made in the team. And through my 20 years, and you've been with me for some time, serving some of the most toughest schools in the country, I always had a 97% attendance rate for my teachers. Mm. 97%. Because they wanted to come to the school because they were invested in the school and they were a part of the decision making. I just left my work in a former district and I asked my principals, what was it about me that you're going to take with you in your leadership belt and take with you for the rest of the um, your years as the leadership? And they said, man, you focus on the on the, on the teachers and you listen to us. Now, Principal Caffelli, I've done this work, man. I know what to do, when to do, how to do it, how to say it. I, I've done that. But, man, I don't know it all. Right. And even when I went back home, I said, hold on. I'm going to a new place, new environment. Let me get me an advisory committee of principals. And I did that. And they started making the decision. They tell, started telling me what they wanted and what they needed. And I took my knowledge. I fine-tuned it. And we put it in action and pew, we soared. And that's how you get the morale build up at your school. You involve everyone. The cakes is it good. You feed them the little lunch is good. You have the little, the little kumbaya stuff. That's good. But that goes away, Principal Cafele. Yeah. If you don't have something sustainable and a system in place and an organizational framework in place at your school. There you go. That people feel good about walking through those doors every day. Leaders out there, assistant principals in particular, since this is where the focus is, you got to think about that. When teachers walk through those doors every day, is this a place that they really want to be? They genuinely want to be. I want to be in this school. 
that morale matters. I got two more. You know, Dr. Anthony Muhammad was the first person that I ever heard say that culture eats strategies for breakfast. Right. I've heard it a million times, but he was the first one I heard many years ago. He may have heard it from somewhere else. I don't know if he coined it or not, but I took it and ran with it. Culture eats strategies for breakfast. I want to ask you, what what is that? What does that statement mean to you as it relates to our audience this morning? It says it says everything. And um, Dr. Muhammad, um, as well as yourself and several other um, educational leader pioneers out there, um, I've been following for years. He's a mentor of mine. Uh, and uh, that statement actually stuck with me when I actually saw him uh, my first year um, as a principalship in Clayton County. Mm. Uh, that actually stuck with me. And that um, was a very integral part of me putting that organizational framework um, in place. I went into a uh, school, Point South Elementary School, Principal Cafele, where they had, quote, made AYP for seven, eight years, and they were high flying, and they had a principal that was there for like 35 years. And here comes this young brother coming here, want to tell us how to change. Um, so I had to quickly, and I was, I was blind at the time. First year, I jumped straight to the cognitive. I wanted to look at the percentages and let them know that you got students that are proficient, but the students at mastery are not that good. So I wanted to jump over here. But I quickly jumped back to the effective domain and realized I had to take care of the people. Their whole world has been disrupted. You had a very veteran staff. You had a few novice teachers, but their leader was gone. And here's this new guy. So Principal Fillet. That's when I started having those one on one conversations and I found out when I asked him, um, how do you feel about this upcoming year? Uncertain. I always give him one word, get one word from uncertain, um, scared, um, frightened. I mean, they, they were just laying it out to me and I had to own that and I had to put a plan of action to actually deal with that. And then I went grade level to grade level and it was some of the same concerns. And so out of that, what I actually that that built that um, culture within the, within the school, and it started with the leadership retreat, where I had everybody from a team, um, a representative from the team, be a part of the leadership retreat. And usually the leadership retreat is just designed for the the principal, the assistant principal. But no, I even had my custodian and my secretary at my leadership retreat. If you don't know this by now, those who know everything that's going on in your building, if you're at the middle school or the high school, your custodian is the most per important person in your school because yeah. they know when every when everything is about to go down and the secretary know everybody's business. That's so right. They, they better be a part of the decision-making process. So he's definitely correct, uh, Principal Cafele. Culture is strategy for breakfast. You can strategize and you can have all the talented teachers, but if you're, if you're not connecting, with one another, if you're not connecting with one another, you will never reach your optimal level. That's right, that's right. Well, I got one more folks, and I would be remiss if I didn't bring the word equity into this conversation. So I, I saved it for last, um, although everything we talked about today is equity. But you know, I, I always draw the distinction between the equity mindset teacher and the equality mindset teacher. That, that equity mindset teacher is the one that sees the student individuality, the student cultural identity, the student voice, sees the differences in young people and meets those differences. Whereas that equality mindset teacher doesn't see those differences. That equality mindset teacher sees the all versus the each and just everything goes to everybody at the same time, same pace, same rate, and let the chips fall where they may. My, my, my question to you is, we know that there are still equality mindset teachers in schools. There are probably many of them. And that's not me doing any bashing. That's just that's just a reality. Um, what would be your advice to a leader that has equality mindset teachers on staff, knowing that equity must abound in those classrooms? Um, first of all, it's, it's very important to... Uh, Number one, you need to pick up Principal Cavalli's um, book. He actually wrote a book on it, and and we didn't rehearse this at all. But if you have the book, you know exactly 
um, what I'm talking about. It's important for you to know the difference between equity and equality. Uh, they're different. Um, also, um, what do those terms um, really um, mean as it relates to your school and your classroom? Uh, myself, uh, I'm an expert. Um, all my research is done in uh, differentiating instructional strategies. Uh, and that required me to look deeply into the learning styles of kids, um, the different type of instructional strategies that would be most effective in my classroom, where I was doing my particular study um, for third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, but through that, I had to look a little deeper because of um, the equity components of it. And most time when people hear um, equity and equality, the first thing people want to think of is black and white. And that's the simple form of it. And you can't remove race from it at all because you have to deal with the variety of um, ethnic groups. Let me take you back to when I was an assistant principal um, at um, Hawthorne Elementary School. After school, we would have about 300 kids that would literally walk home across the street. There was a huge, huge um, trailer park that went on for miles. And we had um, a variety of students, um, a diverse students who used to walk. But a great deal of those students were um, Hispanic students that used to, we had a huge Hispanic population. About 48% of our stat, um, students were Hispanic. Hmm. So that was new for me because I've always dealt with the African-American community. So what I had to do was I had to immerse myself and I had to read about their culture. I had to understand their culture. I had to talk to the kids about things that was going on in the school and why they were doing certain things. And once I was able to do that, once I was able to do that, we were able to perform at a very, very high level. But I had to do a lot of studying. And as I'm stating, for my leaders and my teachers, um, you have to study these things. And a great resource um, to begin with is Principal Cafele's book. Now, when you're studying this information, you're going to be revealed a great deal of information and you're going to see we have a lot of issues going on um, at your school, um, in our school system and in these, and within our country. And you have people that are literally trying to fight that. You don't want to use the um, you mean to tell me we can't use the word equity anymore? Yeah, about that. You mean to tell me we can't talk about race in school, but we have to cover Plessy versus um, Ferguson? There's no way around that. I'm sorry. There's no way around it. So you have to learn about it before you can even understand it or actually even discuss it in your school. And if you don't know anything about it, please don't jump into it trying to teach somebody or talk about it. I love it. And I, I love the example that you used about Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, how, how do I teach Plessy versus Ferguson? And I, and I don't reference race. It, it doesn't make sense, right? How, how, and how do I juxtapose it with um, Brown versus the Board of Education if I don't mention race, right? It's, it, it, it doesn't make sense. And then the word equity and those states who are folding it in, into critical race theory and therefore no mention of that either. We're doing such a disservice to young people, but hopefully this this too shall pass. Right. So look, let me you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the questions, folks, but stick around for a minute because I want to I want to just thank Dr. Jackson for this hour. Um, this has been real. This has been solid, solid information for school leaders out there who can, you know, and particularly assistant principals, because that's the focus who can take this information and just run with it. I say it's the focus, but you know, we got superintendents watching, we got principals watching, we got directors and assistant superintendents, supervisors. So, so everybody got something. So, and that's, and that's the whole objective. So Dr. Jackson, I just want to thank you for blessing us this morning, now afternoon on the East um, mm -hmm. with all this, this invaluable information in this interview. And uh, certainly this won't be the last time, but I want to thank you for it. Tell the folks how to get in touch with you how to get your books, how to book you to come out and give them the fuller, the fuller uh, plate of information. Give it all to them. Yes, and Principal Gafale, before I do that, I would like to throw out a couple acronyms um, to my assistant principals and my leaders, and I want you to write this down. The first one is WAIT, W-A-I-T. 
that is the most important acronym that will come your way, assistant principals, and that is, why am I talking? Why am I talking? You're going to come out and you're going to ask a mentor a question. You're going to ask someone who's in a principal position or a leadership position a question. And you're going to be tempted to say, yeah, but yeah, I know. But you're going to try to somehow, some way interject. And when you really need to sit down and simply just admit when I went from middle school to high school, one of the worst high schools in the city of Atlanta, I was terrified. I called Principal Caffelli. He talked to me for an hour and 13 minutes, and I did not say a word. I did not say a word. He was just talking. Why am I talking? So you have to be quiet. Secondly, WIG, M-S, W-I-G-M-S, when I get my school, make you a journal and entitle it that and write down everything that you're going to do and change based off of things you're seeing in your school, because everything you're doing now as an assistant principal is shaping you to how great you're going to be when you have your own school. And another one, WTOH. What's the opportunity here? What's the opportunity here? When you have these crazy situations that are going on and you deal with the rape, the abuse, the irate parents, what, what's the opportunity here for me to grow? Ask yourself that. And finally, which is most important, this is what we call, uh, Dr. Earl and I call the C's method. That's S-E-E-S. 90% -E -E of your stress that you're feeling on a daily basis can be solved we're using this approach. The S requires some social interaction with someone. You have to have that. When you're in your most stressful situations, you want to isolate yourself. You want to be by yourself. That's a red flag. Call somebody, talk to somebody. The first E, eat well. Principal Caffelli, you can preach on this one, brother. Yes, sir. You used to be in the Waffle House every time you was on the road. You don't even go to the Waffle House anymore. Who? The other E, you have to exercise. Who on this platform is more busier than Principal Gafele? Nobody. Nobody. I'm just being honest. So you have to make time to exercise. And that final S in the C strategy, you have to sleep. You have to sleep. You have to sleep. And if you don't handle your stress, everything gets worse. And as Frisco Philly um, stated, um, I can be reached on social media, um, Twitter at Dr. Marcus Jackson. Um, also, many of you are already my um, Facebook friends. Um, I'm on Instagram at Dr. Marcus, Dr. Mark Jack um, as well. Just look me up, Dr. Marcus Jackson. And um, as Principal Caffelli stated, uh, my books are out. Uh, this one was huge. Uh, 10 Daily Essentials for Principals. This one was a huge hit last year for principals. And at 6.20 this morning, Principal Caffelli, the 10 Daily Essentials for Assistant Principals came out. And also, uh, I have two books on social emotional support for teachers and social emotional support for educational leaders. These are important. And finally, finally, I have to give you this nugget and it's in my book. The Triangle of Success and Collaboration. Principal Caffelli is shaking his head on this one. In 2006, I had a student in my office, and he was telling me about all the things that was actually going on in his world. And so I drew a triangle, and I drew those things on the outside of the triangle, and I drew the child's name in there. And when the parent came in, the parent voiced her concern, and before I brought the student in, I said, look at all the things that your child is going through right now. And we have this triangle that we must form around your child. The administrator, the parent is the foundation, and the teacher. And if any of those things open up and is disconnected, all of these things, all of these germs are trying to get after your child. And through K through 12, it is our job to ensure that we keep these things away from our child. So I just wanted to share this one with you. This is a great communication piece 
that sort of put things in perspective. And I go, I take a deep delve into this in the 10 daily essentials for assistant principal, because it's your job to keep the community and keep this triangle together because you're dealing with most of the issues uh, with these parents as well. But reach out to me on Twitter at Dr. Marcus uh, Jackson.com. I'm sorry, Dr. Marcus Jackson. And uh, connect with me and please use me as a resource. I've been using Brother Kafele. I've been using Anthony Muhammad. Um, I've been using many of you guys. So please don't hesitate um, to um, reach out to me and I'll share this information with you. I appreciate all that information, and I know everybody out there appreciates it as well. Great stuff, a great day. Glad to have you. And and once again, tremendous success in the new position, Chief Academic Officer. Tremendous success there with you moving forward. And and I, and I know you'll be checking back in. Let me let me let me um put you in the in the um backstage. Stay with me for a minute. And uh, folks, once again, glad you're here. Next week, we got Principal Josh Tovar. So mark your calendars, 10.55 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So that's Principal Josh Tovar next Saturday. Once again, and, and Dr. Jackson just referenced it. Let me do it again. Get yourself, get this in your hands, along with the assistant Principal 50 and the aspiring Principal 50. Get them both, y'all. Get them in your hands. I believe wholeheartedly in all three of these books and the other ones I wrote, but we're not going to spend all that time on them. Make sure you visit principalcafele.com for all the resources that I provide. It's, it's not just a website. It's an institute of professional learning. So definitely go to the website and visit and check it out. The blog, the podcast, the videos, all the stuff that's on there. Subscribe and no, like and follow my Facebook page. Uh, virtual AP Leadership Academy. Once again, like and follow my Facebook page, Virtual AP Leadership Academy. I always write a follow-up to the Saturday Academy on Sunday. I try to do it in the morning. Some days, it, it, some Sundays it's hard, but I get it in. So every Sunday, I write a commentary that goes a little bit beyond what we talked about in the session or, 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 or keys in on something we talked about. So certainly uh, like and follow that page, Virtual AP Leadership Academy. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, Virtual AP Leadership Academy. So those of you who um, who missed the um, the previous sessions, you can go to um, to the YouTube channel and watch all 69 of them, right? They're all there sitting there waiting for you. And um, make sure you're taking care of your body, your diet, your, your physical health, your mental health. Make sure you're taking care of yourself because if you're not taking care of you, you're not there to benefit your staff and students. So with that, folks, have a great going into next week. Have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up. Cock that fist back all the way and count to three with me. One, two, three. Bam. Great session today with Dr. Marcus Jackson. I see you guys next Saturday. Make sure you're doing well. Those of you returning back to school this week, first week opening up, have a great week. We'll talk about it next week.